In Azure, custom machine learning implementations require an Azure Machine Learning Workspace resource to be set up and configured. The Azure ML Workspace is a top-level resource for any machine learning work that you're going to want to do. Specifically, the Azure ML Workspace resource is a central location for machine learning artifacts. So if you're building models, defining experiments, storing run metrics, or even creating notebooks, all of that is managed and maintained within the ML Workspace resource and its related resources. In fact, the ML Workspace maintains an extensive history for you. So, for example, you could run all kinds of models and store each of their versions, or you could collect, store, and recall all sorts of run metrics. Now, Workspaces also help to preserve snapshots of your scripts. So you can run notebooks, leave the page, and come back, and you'd see your scripts and their outputs in exactly the state that you left them. So how does one go about using the Azure ML Workspace resources with models? Well, obviously the goal of machine learning is to train a model based on all kinds of different variables. Now that's everything from your data set to your model type to your algorithm and so on. And once you have a model that you've trained to your liking, well, you register it with the workspace. You can train all kinds of models and choose to throw them away or even keep some of them as their own files. But once you have something that you want consumers to interact with, you register it with the workspace. And that gives the model a name and starts the versioning process. Now after that, you can deploy your model over and over again. And each time you deploy your model, you're creating a new version. Each version is then available to consumers so they can use whichever version they prefer. Now ideally, each version is deployed with scoring scripts so consumers can see some of the metrics about that particular version of your model and then choose the best one for them. Now in Azure ML Workspaces, there are a set of usual components. For example, compute instances are used as the compute resources behind notebooks. User roles enable you to grant or deny access to various aspects of the ML Workspace. Compute targets are used to associate certain resources to certain compute instances, or clusters. And there are also associated Azure resources like storage accounts, containers, and so on. Now most of these resources are opaque to you, but it's good to know that they're there. Or at least it's good for your SRE to know that they're there. And that way they can be tuned for cost if necessary. Then there's experiments. Experiments are containers for your model runs. Each time you want to execute a model training session, you want to apply that to an experiment. And experiments can have one or many runs within them. Experiments are contained in an ML workspace. And of course, there are datasets. Datasets can be external to ML workspaces, but the references to those datasets are internal. Now, ML workspaces also include a list of all the registered models and their versions. So you can browse all the models and inspect their various properties. And one of the cooler things in ML workspaces are endpoints. Once you have a registered model that you want the outside world to be able to access, then you can create an endpoint. The endpoint is a globally accessible URL that allows users to access your model and start using it like a web API. Of course, you still need a key to access the API, so it's not just wide open on the internet. But if you have that key, you can access that API from anywhere. Now, Azure ML workspaces include very specific machine learning assets. Now, these assets wrap a lot of the features that we've talked about so far. For example, one asset is compute targets. Well, compute targets are references to compute power needed by various services in the workspace. So, for example, a notebook uses a compute instance and an experiment uses a compute cluster. Those connections to compute power are called compute targets. Now another asset is a dataset. Datasets are probably the single most important thing that you'll need when embarking on your machine learning journey. That data can be used for training models, but it can also be used to run experiments and test models. Another common asset is notebooks. Notebooks allow you to create code snippets, create narrative text, and visualize data. It's a very good tool for training models in an educational way, and we'll look at this in more detail later in the course. Next, we have experiments. Experiments are used to capture model training runs. An experiment can have many runs. Each experiment includes lots of detail about the effectiveness of the model contained within it. And then there's the pipeline asset. This is a visual representation of a model training exercise. With pipelines, you can drag and drop modules to create a workflow 
of how you want your model to be trained. So for example, you can reference a data set and then connect some transformation modules to convert that data set to a more usable format. Then you can connect some model training modules and then add evaluation modules to score the model that was trained. And once all those modules are connected, you can run the pipeline and that run would be tied to an experiment. And lastly, there is the models themselves. Once you run an experiment and produce a trained model that you like, you can register that model. And when you do, the model will appear as an asset. You can then browse all the different models and their versions. Now earlier I mentioned that the Azure ML workspaces make use of some other Azure resources, and that those resources are opaque to workspace users. Well, let's talk about those other Azure resources anyways. First, we have an Azure storage account. Think of the storage account as the database for everything you do in the workspace. The storage account stores pretty much all the information that you generate while using the workspace. So this includes the definition of the pipelines, the arrangement of modules, registered models, notebooks, data sets, and so on. A storage account can contain just about any kind of information. So storing all of these things is no big deal. Next, we have Application Insights. Now, App Insights is a tool that can be used to troubleshoot and evaluate your resource. So if you run into any issues, you can explore App Insights for details on the errors. But it doesn't have to be just about errors either. You can use App Insights to explore the general performance of your system and improve whatever needs to be improved. Now, another key resource is the Azure Key Vault. Key Vault is where any sensitive information is going to be stored. So if you need to enter an API key or a password at any point during, say, referencing an external data set, that information will be stored in a key vault. And this ensures that sensitive information is stored in an encrypted container. And lastly, we have container registries. A container registry is used for managing containers for any of your deployed models. Now, there are several tools that you can use to interact with the Azure ML workspace. For example, probably the easiest way to interact with Azure ML workspaces is with the Azure ML Studio. That's a UI that makes accessing and interfacing with all of these assets very intuitive and simple. It's a good way to step into machine learning. Of course, if you're comfortable with code, you can also use the Azure ML SDK for Python. And if Python isn't your thing, well, there's a version of the Azure ML SDK for the R programming language. It's actually possible to interact with almost every aspect of Azure by using a CLI extension in PowerShell. So technically, you can absolutely interact with Azure ML workspaces by using a CLI extension. But I would concede that it's pretty tedious to try to do that in that way. And one final tool would be the Azure ML VS Code extension. That allows you to interact with the ML workspace right in VS Code. And finally, let's quickly go through what your typical tasks in ML workspace would be. First, you'd create your workflows. That would probably be through a pipeline interface, but you can also do it through straight code using the ML SDK. And once you have your pipeline, you'd run it to execute each of the modules that you defined in there. And once you have your pipeline, you can run it as part of an experiment to train your model. Then once you have your model the way you like it, you can register that model and keep registering new versions. Eventually, you'll get to a model that you feel comfortable exposing to external customers. Now at that point, you could deploy your model using an endpoint. And once you've deployed your model, you'll want to monitor it. You'll want to track its use and its effectiveness as other users make use of it. That allows you to decide whether to make tweaks to the model. Maybe it was 99% effective with your training data, but only 68% effective in the real world. Hey, time for some tweaks. Now another task you can do is simply view the various machine learning artifacts. This is unstructured work, but it does give you some good insights into your system. And finally, one last task that you could perform is automated machine learning. That basically rolls all of the previous tasks into one single task. With AutoML, you're asking Azure to do the work for you. Now that can be highly effective if you're looking to get to market quickly, and at least start somewhere and start getting some feedback. In this demo, we're going to create and configure an Azure machine learning workspace. To do that, we're going to use an Azure portal to create a machine learning resource. Then we'll use the Azure ML Studio to create a compute instance and clone a sample repository. 
Now, before we begin, you'll need to make sure that you have access to an Azure account. So if you don't, you can create one for free at azure.microsoft.com slash free. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is navigate to the Azure portal in our browser. Now, let's create an Azure resource. We'll do that by clicking on the Create a Resource link in the middle of the page. Now, just so you know, you can create a resource by selecting the hamburger menu in the top left and selecting Create a Resource from there. Anyway, now what we want to do is create a machine learning workspace. So let's search for machine learning. Now let's select machine learning. And now we can click create to get the process started. Now when we're creating resources in Azure, we're asked for a bunch of information to help define and categorize that resource. A machine learning workspace is not much different. In fact, in the case of a machine learning workspace, we actually need references to a bunch of other Azure resources in order to run properly. The good news is that the setup page for Machine Learning Workspace actually asks us to choose or create those resources on the fly. So what we're going to do here is create all the resources that we need all at the same time. First, we're going to create a resource group. In my case, I'm going to name the resource group sbdemo07rg. sbdemo-07-rg. Now, this is actually important. It's a really good idea to put your test systems in their own resource group because then you can clean up after yourself really easily just by deleting that resource group when you're done. And that'll automatically delete everything that you put in there. Next, the page asks us for a name for my workspace. Well, since I'm not very creative, I'm just going to call it sbdemo-07-ml. Now, Azure tries to be really helpful here and automatically assumes that I'm creating some new resources. It names those resources based on my SB Demo workspace name, and I'm going to leave those as is. Now, when you create resources in Azure, you can create those resources in specific regions around the world. And that can be critical if you have requirements where data can't leave a certain region. It can also be critical to performance because it means all your core resources are in the same physical data center. But for this demo, you can pick whichever region you want, and I'm going to leave mine as the default. Finally, we'll need to create a container registry. Now, as with most things in Azure, names need to be globally unique. So I'm going to name mine a certain way. First, I'll click on Create New, and then my name's going to be sbdemo07ml, and then a bunch of random numbers. And then I'll click Save, and there's my container registry. Now, we're going to skip all the rest of the tabs here and go straight to the creation step. So let's click on Review and Create. And assuming everything is good with no issues, we can then click on Create. Now, the process of actually creating the machine learning workspace may take a while to complete. Technically, this happens asynchronously, so you could go off and do other things while this is happening. But we're going to wait for this to be done, and I'm going to fast forward to the end. Now our workspace is complete. Let's navigate to it and check it out. In this case, we can do that by clicking on the Go To Resource button in the middle of the screen. So let's click on that. And there we go. Our machine learning resource includes all sorts of blades with all sorts of different information and capabilities from access control to monitoring. So congratulations, you've created a machine learning workspace. But now what we want to do is we want to make use of the machine learning workspace and access the Azure ML Studio. To do that, we simply click on the Launch Studio button in the middle of the screen on the Overview Blade. So let's click on it. So as you can see, Azure ML Studio launches in another tab. Now ML Studio lets us manage lots of different aspects of machine learning, from pipelines to experiments to endpoints. In this course, we're going to spend some time looking at the Notebooks feature. But in order to use the Notebooks feature, you need to have a Compute instance. So let's go ahead and create one now. Let's head over to the Compute section. Now, there are a few different kinds of compute. Clusters are used for pipelines. Inference clusters are used for deployments. Attached compute allows you to bring your own pre-existing compute power. And instances are what's used for notebooks. So we're going to create a compute instance. To do that, let's click on the New button in the middle of the Compute Instance tab. Now, for this demo, we don't need anything fancy. So I'm going to leave all these selections as the defaults. But you can go ahead and choose a VM that makes the most sense for you. That might mean more power or maybe just being cheaper. Now, once you've selected a VM, let's click Next. Now we need to give our instance a name. I'm going to call mine sbdemo-07-ci. And then we can click Create. Now, the creation process takes a little while. 
So we're going to need that instance before we can do the next step. So I'm going to fast forward to when the process is complete. Now that we have a compute instance created, we can finally start using the notebooks feature. So let's go ahead and click on the notebooks section. So what we want to do here is we want to clone a sample repository from Microsoft. Now this repository will give us a few different examples on how to implement notebooks for the purposes of machine learning through code. So let's do it. First, let's click on the terminal icon in the little toolbar above our file list. Now this opens up a new tab in the notebooks app. In the toolbar at the top of the tab, make sure your compute instance is selected and that it's running. I can see that mine is selected and running, so we're good to go. Now in the terminal, let's type the following code git space clone space https colon slash slash github.com slash Microsoft with a capital M learning with a capital L and no spaces between slash ms learn dash dp100 and we'll hit enter. Now this command will clone the ms learn dp100 repository into our notebooks instance. Now let's wait for it to be complete. And it is. All done. But we don't see the repo in our list, do we? Supposedly we cloned it, so why isn't it there? Well, to see it there, we need to refresh the list. So in the little toolbar above the files, let's click the refresh icon. Now we see the mslearndp100 folder under our username. So let's expand that folder. Now notice all the different files under there. Each of these files provides a different tutorial related to machine learning using the Notebooks feature, and we'll jump into some of these files in our upcoming demos. For now, we've successfully created a machine learning workspace, we set up some compute power, and we cloned this sample repo into the Notebooks feature. In this demo, we're going to install the machine learning SDK for Python, and then create a bit of code to connect to our machine learning workspace. To do that, we're going to use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio. So let's get started. Let's navigate to the Azure ML Studio in our browser. Now what we're going to do in this demo is we're going to use the Azure ML SDK for Python to connect to a workspace. And to do that, we're going to need to write some Python code. And the place to write Python code in Azure ML Studio is the Notebooks feature. So let's go ahead and click on Notebooks to get us started. Now, in order to execute code in ML Notebooks, you need a notebook file. So let's go ahead and create one. To do that, let's click on the ellipsis button beside our users folder in the list. Now, in the options list, let's choose to create a new file. Now, let's name the file. I'm going to name mine sbdemo-07. Next, let's make sure to set the file type to notebook. Now we're ready to create the file, but before we do, it's absolutely essential that your file name has the extension of IPYNP. So if it doesn't, make sure to add that now. Anyway, once your file is ready, let's go ahead and click on Create to get us started. So now our file is created, and you'll notice that Azure ML has automatically opened up our file into a new tab. Now at the top of the file, you'll notice a toolbar. And in that toolbar, make sure that you've selected our compute instance that we created in the previous demo. It's also a good idea to make sure that the compute instance is running. Any code that we create and run in this notebook will be run on that compute instance. Now, what we want to do is we want to write a bit of Python code to install the Azure ML SDK. So let's do that. Now, in the file, you'll notice a rectangle has appeared in the display. In that box, let's type the following code pip space install space azure ml dash sdk. Now, what this code will do is it will install the Azure ML SDK on the compute instance we selected, but it's worth noting that you can actually include some optional features when installing the SDK as well. To do that, we can append the optionals to the SDK in square brackets. In fact, let's do that. In the same box, let's add the following code to the end of line one square bracket, notebooks, comma, auto ML, comma, explain. Now what this code does now is that it installs the ML SDK and then also installs three optional features. The notebooks optional installs widgets for displaying detailed outputs. The auto ML optional installs packages for automated machine learning and training. 
and the Explain optional installs packages for generating model explanations. So let's go ahead and run this code snippet. To do that, we'll click on the Play button to the left of the code snippet that we wrote. So now we can see that the Azure ML SDK has been installed. Now we're ready to use it. Now, here's the thing. In order to use the Azure ML SDK, you need to connect to a machine learning workspace. To do that, you need a configuration file. So let's start by getting that file. The easiest way to get that configuration file is from the machine learning resource in the Azure portal. So let's flip over to the Azure portal in another tab. Now in the overview blade of our machine learning resource, notice that there's a download config.json button in the toolbar. So let's click on that to download our configuration file. Now let's flip back to the ML Studio. Now let's click on the ellipsis button beside our user folder. Now let's select Upload Files from the Options menu. Now let's select our file, and let's click the Upload button at the bottom of the pop-up. So now our new file has been uploaded, and you can see the contents in a new Notebooks tab. It's a pretty simple file, isn't it? So now that we have a configuration file, now we can connect to the machine learning resource in our notebook. So let's click on our Notebooks File tab again. Now what we're going to do is we're going to write some simple code here. So at the bottom of the Notebooks page, let's click on the little plus icon. And since we want to write some code, let's select Code Cell from the option list. Now the code we want to write is going to read our configuration file. To do that though, we need to import a package from MLSDK. So let's start by writing the following code. From space Azure ML dot core space import space workspace with a capital W. Now what this code does is import the workspace package from the Azure ML SDK. That lets us use the feature of that particular package. In fact, that's what we're going to do next. In the same block, let's drop a couple of lines down to line three, and let's write the following code. WS, which is a variable name, equals workspace dot from underscore config and open and close circle brackets. Now what that code does is use the workspace package to create a workspace object based on the configuration in our configuration file. By default, the from config method automatically looks for a file called config.json in the same folder as the file the command is run in. So since we uploaded our file to that location, it'll find it. In fact, let's run this code snippet now. Now, sometimes when you run this, you're going to need to authenticate. And if that happens, this code cell will give you a link and a connection key so that you can do that. The other thing to note is that the authentication doesn't necessarily last forever, so you might be prompted from time to time to authenticate. Regardless, at this point, you've successfully created a notebook file, installed the Azure ML SDK, and connected to a workspace. In this demo, we're going to create some Python scripts using Azure ML Notebooks. These scripts will be used to run an experiment, log metrics, and a retrieve and view those metrics. To do that, we're going to piggyback off our last demo where we connected to an Azure Machine Learning Workspace resource. So let's get started. First, we need to head to our Azure ML Studio instance in our browser. So in our last demo, we created a notebook file that installed the Azure ML SDK to our compute instance that we created in our demo before that. The same notebook then used the SDK to connect to our machine learning workspace. Now we're going to piggyback off that demo and use the same file to continue on. So let's navigate to that file. First, let's click on the Notebooks feature in the left-hand menu. And now let's navigate to our test file and select it to open it up. Now in this demo, we're going to use the Azure ML SDK to create an experiment, log some metrics, and then view those metrics. So let's get started. We first need to create an experiment, so let's do that. The first thing we need to do is create a new code cell in our file. So to do that, let's scroll down to the bottom of the notebook file. And now let's click on the plus icon and select the code cell option. So I'm going to go paste some code into this block, but don't worry, I'll provide that code in the doobly-doo so that you can paste it too. Now let me explain this code. On line 2, we're importing the experiment package from the Azure ML SDK. Then on line 5, we're creating a new experiment object. Now notice that we're setting the workspace and a name for our experiment. The workspace parameter is being set to the workspace object that we created in our previous demo, and we'll get to that in a second. 
Meanwhile, the name can be just about anything you want. Now I've set mine to SPDemo07 Experiment. Next, on line 8, we start the experiment. And this creates what's called a run. And it also starts logging our metrics. And finally, on line 15, we complete the experiment run. And that means that anything that we want to do in our experiment has to happen between lines 8 and 15. Now actually, let's see this in action. Now the first thing we need to do is run our previous code snippet where we connected to our workspace. This is just to make sure that we're connected. So let's go ahead and do that and get ourselves authenticated. Now let's run our new code snippet. So at this point we created an experiment and then ran it. It didn't actually do anything, but there should still be a run. So let's go see if that's true. Click on the experiments option in the left hand menu. Hey look, it's our experiment. Let's click on it and see some details. So here we see a bit of information about the experiment, but nothing too impressive. So let's scroll down to the bottom of the page. Well, there's our run. So let's click on it and see what it says. Well, it doesn't say very much, does it? But notice that there's a whole section on the right hand side for metrics. Now we don't have any metrics yet, but if we did, that's where they'd appear. There's also a tab on the top called metrics too. So let's get to work creating some, shall we? Now as it comes to metrics, you're really in control of the type of metrics you want to log, and there are five main methods of logging metrics. Specifically, you can log, which means that you can record a single named value. You can also log list, which means that you can record a named list of values. And there's also log row, which means that you can record an entire row of data with multiple columns. And then there's log table, which allows you to record a dictionary as a table. And finally, there's log image, which allows you to record an image or a chart. Now let's see this in action, shall we? First, let's head back to the notebook section. Now, if your file isn't already open, then let's open it back up. So what we're going to want to do now is we're going to create a very simple metric. We're going to replace lines 10 through 12 in our code snippet with some code I've got in Notepad, and then explain what it's doing. But again, I'll provide that code in the doobly-doo so that you can paste it too. Now let me explain what this new code does. On line 11, we're loading a CSV file with some data in it. Then on line 12, we're simply counting the number of rows in that CSV file. And on line 15, we're logging that row count as a metric called observations. Now there's a problem with this code. You'll notice on line 11 that we're using pandas to load the file, but we've never imported pandas to this notebook. So let's insert a line of code beneath line 2 to get this started. So let's type the following code. Import space pandas as pd, all lowercase. Now, just as a word of caution, this code assumes that you've put your code file in the same folder that you cloned mslearndp100 repo. So if your file is in a different location, you'll need to change the location referenced on line 12 accordingly. So let's run this and see what we get. Now it says our run is complete. So let's go back to that experiments view. And we'll click on our experiment. And now let's open up the most recent run. Notice that we now have a metric called observations. But that's not the only way to see our metrics. In fact, let's use the Azure ML SDK to explore our metrics. So let's head back to the notebook section. And again, if your file isn't already loaded, open it back up. Now let's create a new code cell at the bottom of our file. So I'm going to paste some code in here and once again I'll provide that code in the doobly-doo for you. Now in this code we're importing the JSON package on line 1. Then on line 4 we're retrieving all the metrics from the experiment run that we just performed. And on line 5 we're printing the metrics to the console. So let's run this code and see what we get. There's our observations metric and the same value that we just saw in the run view. So we successfully created an experiment, started a run, performed an operation, logged a metric, concluded a run, and then viewed our metrics in multiple ways. In this demo, we're going to use the Azure ML SDK to run code experiments that log metrics and generate output. To do that, we're going to use a Microsoft sample notebook file to run through a deeper experiment example. To get started, we need to head to our Azure ML Studio instance in our browser. Alright, so in our last couple of demos, we created a notebook file that installed the Azure ML SDK, 
and then created an extremely simple experiment run that logged a very simple metric. In this demo, we're going to use a Microsoft sample to do the exact same thing, but we're going to do a bit more of a real example and get deeper into the metrics than you can produce. We'll also generate some outputs along the way. So let's get to it. First, let's navigate to the Notebooks section. Now, in our first demo in this course, we cloned a sample repo from Microsoft, so let's navigate to that folder. Now, in this folder, there's a bunch of files that show how to interact with various machine learning objects using notebooks. For this demo, we want to run an experiment and collect some metrics. So let's go ahead and open the 04 Run Experiments file. Now, you'll notice that this file has lots of useful information about what's going on and why. It's definitely worth the read to get that extra insight. But in the interest of time, I'm going to go over this relatively quickly and explain the high-level details as we go. So let's scroll down to the first code snippet. Now this code snippet would be really familiar to you. In this snippet, we're importing the Azure ML SDK workspace package on lines 1 and 2. Then on line 5, we're creating a workspace object. In our last demo, we showed how to do this using a configuration file. In this demo, I'll reveal to you that we didn't really need to do that because this is being run in notebooks, and Microsoft's library is smart enough to get that information automatically. So let's run this snippet. Now, if you're not already authenticated, this snippet will result in you needing to authenticate by following the directions. So if that happens to you, go ahead and authenticate. So now we're connected to the workspace and we're good to go. Okay, so now we can actually run an experiment. In our last demo, our experiment didn't do anything except open a file and count the number of rows in that file. And that's obviously not a particularly impressive set of metrics. In this sample from Microsoft, we're going to log some metrics that are a bit more real and useful. In this code snippet, we're using pandas to open a diabetes dataset on line 14. Then on lines 22 to 30, we're creating a chart that shows a bar chart of the number of patients that have or don't have diabetes. Now notice that on line 30, we're also logging that image, and more on that later. Then on line 33, we're creating a list of the distinct number of pregnancies and then logging that list to a metric called pregnancy categories. Next on line 37 to 43, we're creating a set of summary statistics for each of the features in our data set. Specifically on line 43, we're logging each row of statistics that we generate. Then finally on lines 46 and 47, we're taking the first 100 lines of our input data set and saving it to a file called sample.csv into a folder called outputs. So let's run this snippet and see what we get. So we now see that we have a chart, as we expected, that shows the number of patients that have and don't have diabetes. But what about our metrics and that output file? Well, let's explore those. Let's scroll down to the next code snippet. In this snippet, we're using a widget from the Azure ML SDK called Run Details. On line 3, we're asking to show the details of the run that we just performed. So let's run this snippet and check it out. It doesn't really show us anything at all, does it? Ah, but look, there's a link in the top right called View Run Details. So let's click on that. So it opened up in a new browser tab that took us directly to our Run Details in the Experiments section of the Azure ML Studio. So let's click on the Metrics tab. So here we can explore our metrics. Now, notice as you scroll through that not all of the metrics can be visualized as charts, and that makes sense. So let's click on the Table radio button. Much better. Now, for each of the features that we explored, we're seeing the summary statistics. Now let's close this tab and go back to our Notebook tab. Now let's scroll down to the next snippet. Now in this snippet, we're doing two things. On lines 4 to 7, we're gathering all the metrics and then printing them to the screen. Then on lines 10 to 13, we're collecting the list of output files that were created and printing their names to the screen too. So let's run this snippet and see what we get. That's all the same metrics that we saw on the other screen. And you can see that this can be a little gross to look at, but with the access to the raw data, you have the control of doing whatever you want with that data. Now if we scroll to the bottom of the output, here we can see that there are two output files that are generated. Our image and the sample file that we created. Okay, that's great that we can see the list of output files, but what if we wanted to download them? Well, let's scroll down to the next snippet. 
In this snippet, you can see on line 6 that you can download the output files to any folder you wish. In this case, the folder is defined on line 3. Now let's run this snippet and see. Now in the notebook file list, let's click on the refresh button. Now we're seeing a downloaded files folder just as defined on line 3 of the snippet. Let's expand it completely. And sure enough, there's our sample CSV file. Now let's do one more thing. Let's scroll down to the next snippet. Now let's pretend we wanted to troubleshoot an experiment run. Well, each time a run happens, a set of logs are produced, and you can actually explore those logs in hopes to get some additional insights into how the run performed. So let's run this snippet. So we can see from this output when the run started and when it ended. We can see that it ran locally on the VM and that it completed successfully. Now at the bottom of the output, there is no additional log files that are generated. So this is all the information that we have for this particular run. But if we'd used certain modules like model trainers, we'd get some additional logs that we could explore. So at this point, we connected to a workspace, started a run, created a set of more complex metrics, created an output file from our input dataset, completed the run, viewed our metrics in multiple ways, and even downloaded our output file. In this demo, we're going to create a Python script that we'll use to train a model. We'll add parameters to that script and then run it to get a candidate model for our input data. And we'll use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio as well as a sample from Microsoft to walk through an example. Now to get started, we need to head to our Azure ML Studio instance in our browser. Alright, so in our last few demos, we created a notebook file and we ran through a sample Microsoft notebook that both used the Azure ML SDK to directly create experiments and execute some code. Now in this demo, we want to do the same thing, but instead of directly creating the contents of the experiments, we're going to use a separate Python script. To do that, we're going to need to write some Python code. And the place to write Python code in the Azure ML Studio is in the Notebooks feature. So let's go ahead and click on Notebooks to get us started. Now, as we've seen so far in this course, in order to execute some code in ML Notebooks, you need a notebook file. Now, we've already created a notebook file, so let's piggyback off of that one. Let's navigate to our notebook file in our user folder. Now we're ready to rock. All right, now before we get started, let's make sure that the compute instance that we created in the first demo is still selected in the toolbar of our new file. And now we're ready to add some code. So the first thing we need to do is scroll to the bottom of the file. Now let's add a new code cell by clicking on the plus button and selecting code cell from the options menu. Now the thing we're going to do is we're going to paste some code into this cell. Now don't worry, I'll provide this code in the doobly-doo so that you can paste it from there. Anyway, let me paste the code and I'll explain what's going on after that. Now let me explain what's happening here. First, on lines 2 and 3, we're importing some needed packages from the Azure ML SDK. Then, on line 6, we're creating a Python environment to run this code in. Now, I've named that environment my usual SB demo standard, but you can name this however you'd like. Then, on lines 9 to 11, we load some packages and make sure to associate them to our Python environment. Next, on line 14, we load a Python script that we want to execute, and more on that in a second. Finally, on lines 19 to 21, we execute the experiment. Now notice that I've named the experiment the same as we've used so far in this course. So if you want to change that experiment name or use a different one, you can do that on line 19. So back to the script we're trying to execute. You can see the file name on line 15. Now what this command is doing is telling the Python environment which script we want to run. Except that file doesn't exist yet. So let's create it. Let's click on the ellipsis button beside our user folder in the file list. And now let's select to upload a file. Now I'll provide this file in the doobly-doo, but let's choose to upload the sbdemo 7 trainingpy file. Now let's click the upload button in the pop-up. This has uploaded the file and opened it up in a new tab for us to explore. So let's explore this file. On lines 1 to 6, we're importing a bunch of needed packages. Importantly, the packages that are included in the from statement are accessed by the package configuration we did in our notebook file. On line 9, we get a reference to the experiment run that this script is being executed inside. And then on line 12, we use pandas to pull down the diabetes data from the Microsoft repo. 
On line 13, we identify the features of the dataset as well as the label, and we put the features in a variable named x and the label in a variable called y. Then on line 14, we split our dataset into two. The first is a training dataset, and the second is a testing dataset, and the split is 70-30. Then on line 17 and 18, we finally get to training our model based on our training data. And on lines 21 to 23, we check the accuracy of our model and log the accuracy as a metric. Then on lines 26 and 27, we save our model to a folder called Outputs. And finally, on line 29, we complete the run. Now let's go back to our notebooks file. Now at this point, our files are all set up and ready to go, except for one thing. Notice on line 19 that we're referencing a workspace variable called WS. That's our workspace. And we need to make sure that we're connected to our workspace before we execute this snippet. So let's scroll up to our workspace connection snippet and execute that first. Now, if it asks you to authenticate, you'll need to do that by following the instructions in the output. Okay, so now that we're authenticated, let's run our new snippet and see what we get. Our run completed. Now, if we look at the log output, we can see that it completed. And we can also see that it ran our specific file. And if we scroll through the results, we can see a bunch of other information, but it doesn't tell us very much, does it? Well, if we want to see the details, let's go ahead and click on the experiment section. Now let's click on our experiment. And now let's click on the latest run. So now we see the information a bit more easily. We can see that the run was successful, that it took a certain amount of time to run, and that it executed our specific script. We can also see the accuracy metric that we collected, which isn't a spectacular number, I'll admit. Okay, so that's great that we can execute a script, but the point of doing scripts is so that we can run similar experiments without having to constantly repeat ourselves by copying and pasting our code everywhere. And the best way to reuse code is to allow parameterization. So let's do that. Let's go back to the notebooks feature. And let's click on our external script file once again. Now, notice on line 17 that we've hard-coded the regression rate to 0.1. So what we're going to do next is we're going to replace parts of this file with some new code that allows that value to be parameterized. So that means that we need to go into edit mode for this file. So in the toolbar, select the editors item and then choose the edit in Jupyter option. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get a parameter if it's been passed in. Now to do that, we need to paste some code between line 9 and line 11. Now I'll put that code in the doobly-doo for you so you can paste it too. Now this code pulls in an argument called regrate from the arguments passed into the script. The value is then put into a parameter called regrate, which you can see on line 15. The default value for the parameter, if the argument isn't provided, is 0.01. .01. But notice on line 12 that we're referencing a package called arg parse. Well, that's not in our imports, so we have to add it. So let's sneak the following code between line 1 and 2. Import space arg parse. Now all we have to do is remove line 24. We don't need that anymore since it's been replaced by line 16. Now let's save this file by going to the file menu and clicking save. And now we can close this tab. So now that our script accepts an argument, we can pass an argument. So let's go back to our notebook file and do that. So on line 14, we're referencing our script file, and we state which folder that file is in, the name of the file, and which environment to use. Now we want to pass the arguments. Arguments are passed between the file name and the environment, so we'll be inserting a line between line 15 and 16. In that line, let's type the following. Arguments space equals space square brackets single quote dash dash reg dash rate single quote comma space 0 0.1 close square bracket and a comma. Now you can see we're creating an argument called reg dash rate, just like our script looks for, and then we're setting the value to 0 0.1, which is the same value as it was before. So if you want to play with it, go ahead. Now I'm going to leave it like this and I'm going to rerun this snippet the code executed successfully. So there you have it. We've created an external script that we can execute in an experiment run, along with whatever parameters we want.
In this demo, we're going to run a Microsoft sample notebook that will put everything that we've learned so far in this course together to train a predictive model. To do that, we're going to use the Notebooks feature and the cloned Microsoft sample repository to run through an example. So one last time, in order to get started, we need to head over to our Azure ML Studio instance in our browser. So in our previous demos in this course, we've created notebooks, we've created experiments both manually and through external Python scripts, and we've logged metrics, and we've even trained some models. And we did all this using the Azure ML SDK, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and more. In this demo, we're going to pull all of that together to run a sample end-to-end, -end. and we're going to do that using a sample notebook from Microsoft and execute some Python code. So let's go ahead and click on the Notebooks feature to get us started. Now, in our first demo in this course, we cloned a sample repo from Microsoft, so let's navigate to that folder. Now, in this folder, there's a bunch of files that show how to interact with various machine learning objects using notebooks. So for this demo, we're going to put all of our various learnings together and train a model end to end. So let's go ahead and open the 05 train models file. Now you'll notice that this file has lots of useful information about what's going on and why. It's definitely worth the read to get extra insight. But in the interest of time, I'm going to go over this relatively quickly and explain the high level details as we go. Okay, so let's get started. Let's scroll down to the first snippet. Now, anytime you want to interact with the Azure ML SDK, you must connect to a machine learning workspace. Now, we've seen this in all of our demos so far. So in this end-to-end -end example, you can see that connecting to the workspace is the first thing we do. So let's run this snippet and get ourselves connected. Now, remember, sometimes you'll be asked to authenticate. If that happens, just follow the instructions on the screen. Now, let's scroll to the next snippet. In this snippet, we're preparing for training. We know that in order to train a model, we need data. So in this snippet, we're creating a folder called Diabetes Training on lines 4 and 5, and then we're copying a data set into that folder. So let's do that. Now let's move on to the next snippet. In this snippet, we're actually creating a model training script file. You can see on line 1 that the file will be called diabetestraining.py and it will be stored in the folder that we just created. This script attempts to train a classification model to predict whether patients are diabetic or not based on their characteristics. Here's how the script breaks down. On line 14, we start an experiment run. On line 18, we use pandas to load a dataset from the CSV file that we copied earlier. Then on line 21, we identify the features and labels in our dataset. And on line 24, we split our dataset into two parts, a training dataset and a testing dataset, and the split is 70-30. Then on line 32, we create a model using the logistic regression algorithm and pass in our training dataset. And we also pass it a parameter that sets the regularization rate hyperparameter. Now that parameter is set on line 27. We also happen to log that rate as a metric on line 31. Now on lines 35 to 38, we apply our trained model to the testing dataset to predict whether patients in the testing database are diabetic or not. We then determine the accuracy of the results, and we print the accuracy to the screen, but we also save it as a metric. Then on lines 41 to 44, we apply our trained model to the testing dataset to allow our model to tell us what it believes the probability that it's correct is. Then we calculate the AUC or area under the curve and that information is printed to the screen and logged as a metric. And on line 48, we output our trained model to a file in the outputs folder. And finally, on line 50, we complete the experiment run. So remember that the snippet doesn't do any actual training yet. All it's going to do is create a file in our training folder. So let's run this snippet. Now all is done. Let's just double check that. Now in the file list on the left, let's refresh the folder list by clicking on the refresh button in the toolbar. And now as you can see, there's a diabetes training folder, and let's open that up. There's our two files, the dataset and our training script. Okay, let's scroll down to the next code snippet. Now in this snippet, we're actually running the training file that we just created, so let's review what's happening here. On line 6, we're creating a Python environment for our script to run in. Then on lines 9 and 10, we're collecting the Python packages our training script needs and applying them to that environment. On line 13, 
we're creating a reference to our training script file. And here you can see that it's referencing the folder, the file, and the environment to run in. On lines 18 to 20, we create an experiment, and then we start the run. On line 20, you'll see that the run is actually referencing our training script file from line 13. So that means it's running our training script. On line 23, we output the run status. And finally, on line 26, we ask this code snippet to wait for the run to be completed. So let's run this snippet and see what we get. Now keep in mind, it may take a minute to run, so I'll fast forward a bit. So you saw while it was running that the run details were updated in real time during the execution, so you could see what was going on. Now when the run completed, the code snippet was marked with a check mark, and the output showed as completed. So now let's scroll down to the next snippet. Now in this model, we were trying to predict whether patients are diabetic or not. And when we did that, we collected a few metrics that can help us to decide if the model is any good. In this snippet, we're outputting those metrics. So let's run this snippet and see how our model did. Now, with the regularization rate of 0.01, .01, we achieved an accuracy of about 77% and an area under the curve score of about 84%. Now, I can say that if my doctor told me I was diabetic, but was only about this sure of his diagnosis, I'm not sure I'd like that at all. So this model isn't great, but it is something. So let's scroll down to the next snippet. Now, let's pretend that I really did like this model and that it's ready for prime time. I'm so happy with it that I want to make it available for people to use. To do that, I have to register the model. So in this code snippet, that's exactly what we're doing. The snippet is actually bigger than what it's actually doing. The registration happens on line 4. And you can see that it references our model that we saved earlier, and it names it and tags it. But interestingly, it also gives us some properties. Now, these properties are really cool because they're attaching the effectiveness of the model to the model. And this will be more important later. The next few lines of code just output the model information to the screen. So let's run this snippet and register our model. We've registered our model. Now, before we continue, let's go check out what this looks like. Let's click on the Models option in the left-hand menu. There's our model. Let's click on it. Now notice that it says that it's version 1, of course, and that the tags are shown on the right-hand side. More importantly, notice that our properties are also listed. Pretty cool. Now let's head back to the Notebook section. And if the file isn't selected anymore, go ahead and open it back up. Now let's scroll down to the next code snippet. Now, if you remember from our first run, our training script hard-coded the regularization rate to 0.01. .01. Well, we want to parameterize that, so let's do that. In this snippet, we're creating a different folder to put the new training script into, but we still need the input dataset. So this snippet creates that folder and copies the diabetes dataset into that folder. So let's run this snippet. Now let's move on to the next snippet. Alright, so once again, this snippet creates a new training script and saves it as a file in our new folder. And we already went over what this file does earlier, but this time there's one difference. On lines 18 to 21, we collect the regularization rate from an argument called reg underscore rate. If the argument isn't provided, we default to 0.01 .01 again, and that's it. Otherwise, this file is exactly the same as last time. So let's run this snippet and create the file. Now let's scroll to the next snippet. Now this snippet runs our new script, and notice that it's quite a bit smaller than last time, and that's because it takes advantage of a notebook's feature where all the imports and variables that were defined in our earlier run are still there. So all we need to do are import the new things. So on line 2 we reference our new script file, but also notice that on line 4 we're passing in a regularization rate argument and we're setting the rate of 0.1 .1 instead of the 0.01 .01 that was used before. Then, once again, the experiment is run, and we output the results to the screen, and we wait for the run to complete. So let's run this snippet, and wait for it to finish. The run is complete. Now let's scroll down to the next snippet. In this snippet, we're once again showing the metrics of our completed run, so let's see what we got. Okay, so we can see our regularization rate is what we asked it to be, 0.1, and the accuracy and AUC aren't exactly much different, but it did run. Now let's move to the next snippet. 
Okay, so now what we've done is we've generated a new model. It's the same as the previous one, but now it has the ability to have one of its hyperparameters be tuned. So we want this model to be accessible instead of the old one. Well, that means we have a new version, doesn't it? In this snippet, we're registering our new model as a new version of the existing model. So notice on line 4 that we're referencing our new model file and referencing the existing model name, and once again passing the updated metrics. Now the important part here is that we're not saying anything about a new version specifically. By referencing the same model name as before, Azure will automatically register our new model as a new version. So let's run this snippet. So as you can see, we're actually seeing the two distinct versions output to the screen. Now let's see what this looks like in the models section. And now we can see both versions of our model. So there you have it. We've connected to our workspace with the Azure ML SDK. We've collected and prepared a data set. We've used an external script to train a classification model based on that data set. We've parameterized a hyperparameter in that script. We've collected some metrics about our trained data set. And we've saved our model, registered our model, and even versioned our model. So in this course, we've examined Azure Machine Learning workspaces. We did this by exploring features and components of the Azure Machine Learning Workspace, creating an Azure Machine Learning Workspace, installing and using machine learning SDKs for Python, running machine learning experiments and Python scripts, logging metrics and generating outputs with the Azure Machine Learning SDK, and Azure Machine Learning training and using Jupyter to train predictive models. In our next course, we'll move on to examine Azure Data Platform Services.